Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you here, whether you're sitting out there in your pews or you're out there in Internet Land. If you are on Internet Land, please uh, share, like, and, and leave us a comment. <laughs> I'm on Heart Jesus over it's again. It's still there. Okay. <laughs> I taped it on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Today's Father's Day, but I'm going to start out with a little joke. I was told this morning, and, and I kind of liked it. So, this uh, married couple was laying in bed, you know, and the woman was laying there, and all of a sudden she felt her husband's fingers, you know, just lightly caress her neck and then down her shoulder and her arms and down that side of her body. And then a little bit later, she felt the fingers on the other side on her neck, down that side of her body, you know, and that feels really good, you know, and then it quit. So she laid there for a few minutes, and she rolled over, and she said, hey, she said, uh, that felt really good. Why did you quit? And the husband said, well, I had to. I found the remote. <laughs> All right. Uh, 3.30 to 7 p.m. today is the Trinity Youth Rally. On Monday at 2 p.m., the WO meeting will be here at the church. The Alice is the leader. Uh, July 4th is Independence Day. July 6th, there's a ladies' luncheon. And I'm guessing that'll be at Plains, Great Plains Restaurant. Uh, July 7th, SRBA Executive Board Meeting. July 11th through the 14th is Youth Camp. July 24th is Community Gospel Scene. Uh, August 1 through 5 is Children's Camp. And August 3rd is Day Camp. Our shoebox items is toys. Our noise offering goes to the Pike County Christian School. And the WOM Mission Action is prizes for Tri-County Care. All right. Is there any other announcements? Well, let's go to anniversaries and birthdays. Okay, in honor of all the fathers here, I have a poem. A father is neither an anchor to hold us back, nor a sail to take us there, but a guiding light whose love shows us the way. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Should we give him the boys some toys? <laughs> the toys. <laughs> <laughs> it was Tony's fault. <laughs> That's Tommy's boy. <laughs> he, he was trying to put me up to some mischief. <laughs> It is Father's Day, and so I congratulate all the fathers and for everything that you're able to do. And, uh, and of course, uh, we are here today actually to worship our Heavenly Father, so it seems very appropriate. And in that mindset, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you, Father, for watching over all your children, for uh, uh, showing us your love disciplining us when we need it. We just pray, Father, as we come before you this morning, that you would accept this offering of our worship, that you would bring us closer to you, and that we would uh, leave from here, Father, closer to you than when we came in. As we offer this prayer in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Despite my best efforts to hide the way I feel, it is, as most of you have known me long enough to know that that's not possible with Jerry because uh, I talk too much when I feel good and I talk too much when I feel bad, but uh, it's sure good to be feeling a little bit better. And uh, I thank you all for your concern and prayers and contacts and so forth through our little ordeal. And, if, and all of you have been through that little ordeal. I guess it was just that for a man, I had decided that we were bulletproof. You know, we had done everything we could do to break the rules, it seemed. We weren't not, we'd gotten careless with our uh, taking care of, you know, uh, isolation and so forth. And uh, it may have been good that the Lord said, kind of got our attention, you know, that, and it's, we had a couple of days we didn't really feel very good. And it, it seems drawn out in the after effects. I've talked to a lot of people, you know, when you, when you can't smell strawberries and you're doing, you know, you're burning strawberries, you don't have any smell. And that we, we've been through that and still, still have that. But anyway, hopefully that's behind us now. Now, one other thing, in choosing appropriate hymns for Father's Day, I discovered a long time ago that there's not that many songs in the Baptist hymnal, at least, about our earthly dads, our fathers. So, I did a little research to see, and most all of the hymns that I've chosen today, not most of, all of, I think, have to do with what you said in your prayer about our Heavenly Father, which is the most important thing for us to remember anyway. So hopefully the songs will have special meaning for you today. Turn to 308. Not all, but most of them. Most of them. Hymns are selected on that basis. Let's stand together and sing... Glorious is thy name. And I'm going to ask Gene to have a prayer after uh, after we sing this. To stand for 308. Glorious is thy name.
seated please. Turn to 237. I'll let you sit to stand. To sing, I stand amazed in the presence. 237. Forty-six. We did this song not very long ago, and I try to space them out so we don't overdo them. But this is one of my very favorite hymns, and uh, it's appropriate for today, so we're going to do it again. Forty-six. This is my father's world. Those of you who enjoy the sunrise and sunsets. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the vault of rocks and 
101, 101. How deep the Father's love for us. Yeah. 
It's starting to make me wish we had security. <laughs> All his idea. Yeah. <laughs> Talking out of the bus. <laughs> so it seems kind of obvious that on Father's Day I might talk about fathers, but I actually want to talk about something very in particular, men of integrity. And I don't think anyone would argue the point that all fathers would, you know, we would like all fathers to be men of integrity. Um, so I think it's kind of fitting, but I also think that it's, it's somewhat gender neutral because quite honestly, we'd like everybody to be people of integrity. And so um, as I was studying on this and how, how integrity might affect our lives, I came across the, the writing of a gentleman by the name of Guy McGraw was his name. Now, in 2001, he was a pastor. Quite honestly, I've lost track of him. I have no idea what he's doing now. Um, but some of the stuff he wrote in 2001, I wanted to share with you today. So I, of course, want to give credit where credit is due. So if I ask you for a biblical example of a, of a man of integrity, who might you think of? And there's there's multiple correct answers. Matter of fact, I don't know. You know Modern day? No, uh, in the Bible. Oh, in the Bible. Men of integrity, or a person of integrity. Well, the one, okay. Paul. Paul. Absolutely, Paul. Um, now, the one I want to bring up is is Job. Now, um, Job is definitely, you know, Job's one of those cases where we actually know him for other things, right? I mean, you know, if, if, I, if I had said, give me a biblical example of a person with patience, boy, you know, yeah, all hands would have been up. Um, but, but Job was absolutely a person known for his integrity. And, and we're going to be discussing that. You, know, you would like, and I think, I think I, I speak for myself, but I think I feel confident speaking for everybody. We all want to be known for something, right? And we'd like it to be something good. Um, the story goes of this backwoods preacher. He found this small boy all alone playing in the dirt. And he was a little concerned. So he says to the boy, he says, where's your father? The boy says, he was hanged last week is kind of stunned. He says, where's your mother? 
Well, she ran off. Um, your sister? She's still in jail. Is there anybody else left in your family? Yep, I've got a brother. Okay, great. Where's your brother? He's at Harvard University. <laughs> he said, well, at least there's one member of your family that's doing well. What's he studying? Nothing, says the little boy. They're studying him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all been there, right? Yeah, we all want to be known for something. Uh, but in Job's case, you kind of know the story. God permitted Satan to destroy everything in Job's life, almost everything he had done. And then at the end of the story, God restored everything double. Um, it was because of God's, oh, I'm sorry, because of Job's patience and, and uh, God's uh, faithfulness during this trial. So in the end, Job is in a better place. But this story, when, when we tell this story, generally we look at two things. We look at um, patience and we look at righteousness and and we look at faithfulness and all of those is true but this morning we're going to look at it from the view of integrity Job was the man who could not curse God and I never thought about that before you know I know he would not but I have to agree with Reverend McCall he could not curse God so in order to look inside of ourselves, we're going to look inside of Job and see what drove this person. Try to get to understand his heart a little bit. What made him respond to this tragedy in the way he did? So if you'll turn to the book of Job, we'll get there very shortly. And it's in verse 1. I think most of you got better things to do than, than read containers, but if you've ever picked up a, a can of shaving cream and read it, you would see some interesting comments on there. It would be, warning, contents under pressure. Do not puncture or incinerate. Do not throw into a fire. Keep out of the reach of children. Harmful or fatal if swallowed. Now, okay, so I had to ask the obvious question. Really? You really need to tell me that it's harmful or fatal if swallowed? And the answer is yes. Somebody, somewhere, needed to be told not to eat shaving cream. But sometimes in this life, we can get in such a state that we actually feel like we are the can of shaving cream. Our contents are under pressure. And sometimes mom and dad probably should be keep, kept out of reach of the children. <laughs> Especially when they do something, and I hope you appreciate this, completely totally opposite to the logical thought you have instilled in them from birth. You see, I'm trying to get away from using the word stupid. <laughs> In the book of Job, it starts out with a very simple and straightforward statement. Chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. That's pretty simplistic. But everything about Job, Job, if you take, if you take just that first sentence, it, defi it defines Job perfectly. Everything about his character was related to those first two, to those two words. The first word being perfect, and the second word being upright. Upright simply means to be straight, not deviating from any of God's standards. And I think it reinforces the description 
of Job being perfect. If we look into the Hebrew Bible, we learn that the word perfect is a Hebrew word tam, T-A-M. It means to be complete, to be in your entirety, not lacking in any respect. An equal word to that might be the word blameless. It corresponds to the Latin word integer, which of course we use in math, an integer meaning, you know, the whole, but it is also the root word where we get our word integrity. He was a man who was blameless. He was a man who was upright. He was a man who had absolute and complete integrity. Today, you know, integrity has lost a lot of its meaning. It means to be sound in moral principles, to being upright, honest, sincere. And Job, Job was all of that, but he was also much more. He was a man of integrity. He was out without moral blemish. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had more politicians that we could say were men and women of integrity? Now, I'm not saying that there are none, and there are, are there others that might argue that point. I'm not saying that there are none. They do exist. Boy, we could use more. Truth be told, though, we can say that about most any profession, most any place, and I'm sorry to say, including preachers. 65% of America's high school students say that they would cheat on an important exam. What are we teaching our kids about integrity? 53% said they would lie to protect a friend who had vandalized school property. Again, what happened to integrity? And this is all based upon a poll of more than 5,000 children between the 4th and 12th grade. It included public, private, and parochial schools. So how do you and I know if we have integrity? Ted Ingstrom had, uh, had an interesting definition. He said, simply put, integrity is doing what you said you would do. It means you keep your promises. Someone once said, and this one's pretty well known, integrity is what you do when no one is watching. That sums it up pretty good too. So if you promised the Lord that you would give him the glory, integrity means that you're gonna keep on doing whatever you need to do in order to ensure that he receives the glory. What we can learn about integrity from Job's life is that integrity can be demonstrated. You can see it. You can know that it's there. It can be destroyed. Integrity can be determined. That is, you must will it to be so. When I used to, I used to work for the Navy Recruiting District in Raleigh, North Carolina. So all recruiters in the state of North Carolina came to me for training. Now it wasn't my duty to train them on how to be recruiters. It was my duty to train them on maintaining the integrity of the U.S. Navy by not just letting anybody in, even though they had quotas to fill. And one of the things I used to tell them is, a lot of your fellow recruiters are gonna tell you that they lost their integrity in this job. They are lying. They did not lose it. They gave it away. And I still hold to that. If someone has lost their integrity, they lost it because they gave it away. When a person lacks integrity, you and I, we know it. We figure it out. 
But when a person has integrity, it is also quickly demonstrated to us. In the story in Job 1.8, it says, The Lord God said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? So catch something about that. God asked Satan if he had considered the integrity of Job. And forgive me, I always I, I always pronounce it Job. I, it's just the way it is. But, um, but here's the question for you. How did Satan know? I mean, God's omniscient. So obviously he knew that of, Job's, of Job's integrity. But how did Satan know? There's only one answer, isn't there? He had to see it. He had to witness it. You know, if you're sneaky, if you're subtle, if you're deceptive, you might be able to hide those character flaws. But if you have integrity, it is going to shine. It is going to be a bright light demonstrated to all of those around you. The songwriter Asaph said of David in Psalm 78, he says, God chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfold. From following the ewes, great and young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people, Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. David fed Israel through the integrity of his heart and guided him by the skillfulness of his hands. Integrity is always demonstrated. First Kings says, talking about Solomon, says he says, If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. See, everybody knew that David was a person of integrity. He wasn't perfect. He was flawed, just like the rest of us. But he was a person of integrity. And that was something that could be demonstrated, something that could be seen. Someone once said, it is not what we eat, but what we digest that makes us strong. Not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. Not what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned. And not what we profess, but what we practice that makes us Christians. Amen. That's pretty deep. Yep. So the question we should ask is, does our integrity shine through? <clears throat> is it demonstrated in our words and our deeds and things that we do whether anybody's looking does our family see that integrity do they see the sound moral principles the things that happen in your life that prove that you're a person of integrity in Sunday school this morning we talked about how Solomon was going to have things happen that were going to happen actually to his son and I don't know if we get into it later on in the book or not but we find out that his son did not follow in his father's footsteps and you have to ask yourself what did he see in his father did his father have integrity we know from I mean just this morning in Sunday school we talked about how later in his life, not so much. Do people in our church see our integrity? Job made it very clear that it was demonstrated. He was a man who demonstrated a perfect and upright in all his ways. Now keep in mind, we know all of this stuff about Job, 
and we use him as a focal point and as a reference, Job didn't know all of this. You know, when when his when his um, my mind wants to say brothers and sisters. No, when his children when his children would get together and have a party, he would go over and offer a sin offering. He didn't know if they had sinned or not, but just in case they did, he offered an offering for it. Well, he'd go back later on and tell the rabbi, hey, just want to let you know, kids are covered. If it comes up, we did, you know, this is what we did. No. He wasn't being watched. Well, actually, he was being watched, wasn't he? He just didn't know it. That is the sign of a person of integrity. Is it really possible for integrity to be destroyed? Well, Job's wife, well, this is Job, um, she makes this comment, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. She's wondering, after all he's gone through, losing their sons and daughters, losing their, their crops, losing their, uh, their cattle, losing their servants, can he still maintain his integrity? C.S. Lewis actually wrote in his journal, and he was having this exact same issue. And in his journal, he wrote shortly after the death of his wife. He wrote, Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe that dread, the, coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not so there's no God after all, but, so this is what God's really like. Deceive yourself no longer. You hear that? He didn't think he, he was afraid. He was concerned. Not that he was going to think there wasn't a God at all, but that he was going to start believing God to be an evil tyrant, or at least a non-compassionate God. And that worried him. That concerned him. Job's, air quotes, friends were talking to him. One of them was named Bildad. And Job responds to Bildad and says, God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from Job refused to talk bad about God. And he was aware that his integrity could be taken from him, that he could lose his integrity. All of his actions, everything he said, everything he did, would hold up to that. And the amazing thing is, as far back as this is in time, the truth is still true today. The truth is still true this morning. The way we live, we either demonstrate our integrity or we destroy it. Mark, I'm sorry, Psalm 37 says, Mark the perfect man. Now that is that word tam that we talked about earlier. It's the word that means integrity. The same one that was used of Job. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Integrity retained leads to peace, but the exact opposite is also true. Integrity lost leads to turmoil. There was a preacher by the name of Philip Brooks. 
he was known for his poise and his quiet manner. And, but like most of us, he suffered. He suffered from frustration, irritability. One day, a friend of his saw him just pacing back and forth, muttering under his breath. And he says, his friend says to him, What's the trouble, Mr. Brooks? And Reverend Brooks replies, I'm in a hurry and God isn't. <laughs> yeah, we, we've all been there. But integrity is a matter of determination, a conscious decision that we are going to have it under our control. And there have been times, I'm going to confess to you, there have been times I've let it slip. Where someone has said something, and I said something back. And if I had the power, I take it back. But it can't be done, can it? But to have a clean hands and a pure heart, it's up to us. Job was determined to hang on to his integrity. After wave after wave of violent destruction hit him, ruined him, and still he held on to his integrity. Verse 22, In all this Job said not, nor charged God foolishly. So it's a nice concept. It's nice to talk about. Easy to talk about. Not so easy to do. Job could not, would not curse God. His wife didn't see any salvation in sight. To her, all was lost. And he suggested that he curse God and God. And through all that, at the end, the writer says, and all this did not Job sin with his lips. And yet, I have to ask myself kind of a simplistic question. Why? And how? How do you have all that happen to you and not blame God at all? Well, it's because very simply, he decided he was going to. He decided he was not going to blame God. Nothing in his life would cause him to curse God. And that's why the chapter ends with that all-important verse. In all these things, God did not sin with his life. Because sometimes things happen. I apologize, my phone's decided not to play well with others. But sometimes we ask ourselves, why? Why me? Why now? Why this? And sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, it's really just another form of cursing God. Like, God, explain yourself. What are you doing? Now, I'm not saying this, that there's anything wrong with asking why God. But are you really wanting to know what God's plan and glory and how this is going to bring glory to him? Are you really asking God, explain yourself, justify yourself to me? Because both of them would be the same question, right? But the intention would be very different. It would be very inappropriate for me to throw this across the room, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, but you know what the best way for you to keep your integrity? The best way is to just keep quiet. Because that's when we sin, right? When we open our mouths, when we say things that we shouldn't. That's the mark of a determined integrity. When we to lash out at God 
when we refuse to curse God in the midst of the darkness. David said, I will sing of the mercy and judgment of the Lord unto thee, O Lord, I will sing, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. He says that in Psalm 101. Psalm had a, uh, David had a lot of problems too, didn't he? He had some, I mean, he had people that should have been on his side, that should have been his fast, dear friends. He had his son who, who tried to dethrone him. He had a lot of, he had a lot of things going on. But that shows the determination to walk in integrity. But as for me, I will walk in integrity. It's a matter of will. It's a matter of the law. And it's a matter of the tongue. We have to determine that no matter what is thrown in front of us, we will not curse God. Because that's where we really lose our integrity. We might lose our integrity with other people, but with God, it's when we question him. The character of Job reveals, reveals to us the importance of integrity. In a world full of cheaters and liars and financial and spiritual con men, we have to walk in integrity. And if there is one character quality that is conspicuous by its absence, that is the quality of integrity. So I encourage you all, no matter what we go through in this life, keep in mind that no matter what befalls us, we know we don't. How can I? <laughs> trying to say it, and it's coming off two different sides. Don't you hate it when your thoughts kind of meet in the middle and don't come out? Um, we know we don't always have control over the things that happen in our life. But we always, always have control over how we respond to the things that happen in our life. So as we go through this week, let's let the weather get hot. But our demeanor remain cool. And let us bless our Lord. Thank you. Will Jerry? Please turn to 249. Jesus paid it all. 249. <laughs>
So I thank all of you for being here this morning and hope you have a beautiful rest of your Sunday. We do have our prayer meeting tonight at 6.30. I encourage you to be here and be a part of that. Are there any announcements that either weren't made earlier or probably bear repeating? Remember Steve Hewlett uh, on Thursday is having back surgery, which is quite extensive. Anything else? Yes, good. Um, my aunt Rachel Cole will be 113 uh, in a couple of weeks, and I'm sure she was creating the cards uh, for those of you that know her. That's awesome. Yeah. Tony, could I ask you to give our closing prayer, please? Then we praise you and we just, just ask that you be with us throughout this, this week and just uh, let the lesson of uh, this sermon touch our hearts and, and uh, not leave us. And just keep your complete hand on us throughout the week and, and uh, just uh, be with us and, and uh, just protect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Pastor, can I ask you a question about sermon this morning? Because I think everybody. What would Job's wife have gained and her request been granted if, she, if he had cursed God? And I'll tell you what. This is